I like the shirt. Yeah. It is. It's a, it's a gorgeous color. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. So this is a season where we should be examining ourselves way ahead of time. It's very hard to do that though, when you're examining yourself. But examining yourself comes from a heart that wants to. Changes come from one's own desire. And it is true that they are internally referenced. But we need scriptures. And we need each other to really help us accomplish that fully. I don't believe that we can accomplish that on our own. As a matter of fact, I know we can. We need our, our God and we need our, our elder brother and our Lord Jesus. I'm going to turn to Matthew, or sorry, to John, uh, to John 16, the Gospel of John chapter 16. And for very good reason. This was where we were at last week. And uh, it was very insightful. Because Jesus said some very profound words that I don't think are completely understood because some of these things have yet to be fulfilled and some of these things we also have to personally experience in verse 5 he says to them something very remarkable something that was to fulfill the Old Testament scripture Old Testament scriptures that the disciples knew all too well that he would send the Holy Spirit he would pour out his spirit on the people in the last days so in the words of Christ, he says, Now I'm going to him who sent me. And yet, none of you asks me, Where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. He just told them that they would suffer all kinds of persecution. And that it would be so extreme that anyone who was going to kill them was actually thinking that they were going to be offering themselves a service to God by killing them. That's how extreme it would be. So they were filled with grief because of who was telling them this. This was their Lord. This was their Master. They had seen him do great miracles. They knew who was speaking to them. Do you know who's speaking to you? He says to them, it is for your good, but I tell you the truth, as always. And it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless, unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. Right? So there was this happening that had to occur. He had to die. He had to die for the sins of the world. Right? There was a plan in place. And he's saying, if I don't die, and if I don't go away and, and I'm resurrected, then a counselor can't come to you. But what's this counselor? What is this thing? But if I go, I will send him to you. That's a promise. And when he comes, Here's something very profound. Not many people understand the full content of what this means. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in three phases, having three things that are important. In regard to sin, right? He's going to convict the world of, of guilt. And righteousness, he's going to be able to weigh and evaluate and determine righteousness. And judgment. Because there will be a summation, an accumulation, a record kept, not only of those who communicate, who follow God's law, who succumb to, to the will of the Spirit, who overcome, like we had in our opening prayer today, the carnal nature that's so hard. And that's where perseverance comes in. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. These are the three pillars. These are the three factors that are going to occur. So we're going to stop right there. We're going to keep that in mind of those three functions that the Holy Spirit is going to perform and already has performed and is performing right now. Deuteronomy. This was right from the beginning, as all things were. Deuteronomy. Oops. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 10. This is very, very poetic, but this is poetry from God's Spirit. The same Spirit that's going to pronounce judgment 
right? In verse 10 it says, In a desert land he found him. In a barren and howling waste he shielded him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, his very favorite thing, the thing that we think about during the day, the thing that causes our heart to lift, those things that we love. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its pinions. He's using what he created and the function of it to describe his care. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. He made him ride on the heights of the land. And when you think about the life that we live in this continent and in this Western Hemisphere, we live a life with a lack for nothing. We ride on the heights of the land. And fed him with the fruit of the fields. Drive through our, our towns. Drive through our provinces. Drive through the United States. We are the breadbasket of the world. We fed the world. We still are feeding the world. He made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with the honey from the rock and with oil from the, from the flinty crate, with curds and milk from the herd and flock, and with fattened lambs and goats, with the choicest rams of Bashan and the finest kernels of wheat. You drank the foaming blood of the grape, the fat of the lamb, the life with the lack for nothing. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked, filled with food. He became heavy and sleek. Don't I know it? He abandoned the God who made him, unfortunately. And he rejected the rock, his savior. They made him jealous with their foreign gods, and they angered him with their detestable idols, these things that we put in our heart. They sacrificed to demons. Right? which are not God, gods that they had not known, gods that recently appeared. What does that mean? Gods that recently appeared. He's talking about a time here. We read in Timothy how people will abandon the truth, this knowledge that they have been blessed with, this knowledge that has been carted to them personally by the Holy Spirit. Christ has taken for what is his, and he has made it known to us. Those same people will turn their back on the truth, will turn their ears away from hearing the truth, and they will follow after doctrines of demons. Read this with me. They sacrifice to demons which are not God, gods that they had not known, something new, something strange, something had made its force known, this spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Gods they had not known. Gods that recently appeared. Gods your fathers did not fear. You deserted the rock who fathered you. Wow. You forgot the God who gave you birth. And if you're a woman and you've given birth to a child, then you, like no one else, could associate with exactly what our Heavenly Father is trying to say. You abandon the one who gave you birth. Imagine that. Because only a woman could really feel the depths of what he's trying to say. He equipped her with those depths. He gave her that emotional level to carry out things that a man could only hope to achieve but not. The emotional level that carries them through to the nurturer and the center piece of so many lives. She is spread out and her love is spread out over so many lives. She is never her own, because God has given her heart to capacity. Well, God, like these women, fathered this nation, a nation that turned their back on the one who bore it. You forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and he rejected it, because he was angered by his sons and daughters. This is talking about sons and daughters right from the beginning. 
right from the from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. Because he was angered by his sons and daughters, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation. Now this is again calling to the hallmarks of a particular time. Now it could be a time that repeats itself. A saturation point that comes and goes continually. But there's one inevitable one that produces the end of all things. The end of the time of man. For they are a perverse generation. Children who are unfaithful to the one that bore them. Imagine that. Really amazing. You go to Psalm 66. You know, I always thought that a parent would not justify their means and their rules to their children. They might explain some of them. But when they say that they want something done, they expect to be obeyed. That's how it used to be. And if you lose sight of that, all you need to do is think back to the generation that walked before you. They expected to be obeyed. And they weren't going to sit there and explain themselves and talk to the little child that they have to lead, that they have to provide leadership. They wouldn't talk to the little child like it's another adult. That child needs to be led. It needs leadership. But our God is describing how he feels. He's telling you what's stored up in his heart. He's trying to make a connection with those who have hearts to receive it. And they're becoming very rare breed indeed. Psalm 66. Here is one who had a heart to receive it. And verse 16. Very wonderful words. Verse 16 of Psalm 66. Come and listen. All you who fear God, who have the heart to fear God, let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So this is telling you that when you pray, you need to really repent and you really need to have nothing that you're holding on to in your heart because it can block your prayers. King David is describing some of the mechanics behind us right now. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God was surely has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer. It's the attitude of a man who never thought himself worthy or withheld his love from me. Wow, very beautiful stuff. You know, what did this man understand? That we could be edified even to this day from so many things that he wrote down. How powerful was the spirit in him, in this king. This king that will be king again. So says the mouth of God. Isaiah 59. This is a scripture that we know very well. Isaiah chapter 59. And you know, as we read through these things, so much is, is revealing to us. The thoughts of our God, the feelings of our God, our capacity and ability to be able to be heard and to be able to associate with our God. Verse 1 of chapter 59 in Isaiah. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. He can do it. Nor is his ear too dull to hear your cries. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. So that he will not hear. He won't hear. And King David just told you that. If he cherished any sin and held on to any sin in his heart intentionally, God wouldn't have heard him. This is complementary to this. This is the understanding of the Spirit. This is known of Christ and it is known of those who he called. So that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood and your fingers with guilt. How's that? I tell myself, well, my hands aren't stained with blood. 
My fingers are dirty with guilt. How could that be? Well, if you go to 1 John, chapter 3, and verse 15, it says in 1 John, chapter 3, 15, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Wow. And actually Christ gives it full clarity here. In Matthew 5, right? this is, was the teacher of John. Matthew chapter 5 and verse uh, 21. Christ now was bringing it into full perspective so that there could be no doubt, so that they understood. So Matthew 5, 21, it says, in the words of Christ, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you're aware of this, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment as a commandment breaker. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Now remember what we read about the spirit with the counselor Cain, that it would come to condemn the world of sin, of righteousness, as a witness, and judgment. Now the New King James says, in verse for verse 22 that anyone who is angry with his brother without cause that's in the New King James the NIV for whatever reason leaves that up some manuscripts have without cause and that makes sense right because you can be angry just as God has, has anger you can be angry with somebody that has done something terrible to you and it's something that you need to work your way through with God's help. But if somebody isn't coming to, for repentance, if somebody, someone isn't showing the fruit of repentance, then you don't have to be a sucker. You don't have to keep lining yourself up to be getting hit and knocked down over and over again. Nobody expects that. If you're brought at a particular capacity, we're told to turn the other cheek, of course. But the Apostle Paul added some clarity to it when he said, as much as it's up to you, Live at peace with all men. And that's what we should be doing because we're ambassadors. But it doesn't mean we don't have an obligation to protect our kinfolk, our community, and our families. We do. That's a story for another day. But some of the manuscripts, the earlier manuscripts, say without cause. We'll be subject to judgment. Right? And even with the omission of those words, they'll be subject to judgment. The judgment of Jesus who will weigh your heart and be able to tell what was in it. And if you were indeed guilty of sin, the Holy Spirit produces that judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Rakha, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, if you're on your knees praying, if you are doing your duty before God, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Right? The brother that has something against you is not commanded to go to see you. You are commanded right here. Then leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Because the awareness of that fact has come to you. And notice how it's come to you when you're ready to lay your gift before your God. That's when it strikes your mind. That's what it strikes your heart. God is saying, when that happens, Jesus is telling you, go and reconcile. Leave your gift there. Leave your obligation and duty there first. And first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Then come and pray to me and request of me. But make amends first. Heal it first. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way. Or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, 
and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth. You will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So we're commanded to act upon those things when they come into our heart. The regret, the remorse, the fact that we know that we need to make it right. You know what you need to do. Jesus is telling you to act upon it. Because so much depends on it. You have to act upon it. And that's the words right from our Lord's mouth. So back to Isaiah 59. I should have told you to keep your finger in there. So right there. Your hands are stained with blood. Now we know how this is possible. Even though we would think of ourselves as innocent. And your fingers with guilt. Now here's another thing that God hates. Your lips have spoken lies. And your tongue mutters wicked things. Now if we could see ourselves in any of that, we know what we ought to do. And this is the time that we need to take charge and we need to examine ourselves. We're coming into the Passover season. We're renewing our covenant with our God. This is not a small thing. So if you see yourself in some of that, and I can answer that for my own self, I can't answer that for anybody else. If your mouth has uttered wicked things, things that you shouldn't say, then you need to counsel yourself over that. And you need to rein it in. Because we're entering in to, or we're stepping on holy ground. We're coming into a holy time. But his focus and his spirit is going to be judging those who are worshiping at the altar spiritually speaking. Those that pray to him, those whose hearts he's called, those hearts that are wonderful. We'll get into that a little bit later about the heart that someone is born with. That heart has been gifted to them by the God Almighty. As much as that's hard to believe. They have that heart for a reason. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, he says, no one calls for justice. We can really see that in our land. No one pleads his case with integrity, right? How do you say you're innocent and you point the finger at somebody else, but your hands are dirty? Like Christ said, take the beam out of your own eye. Then you can see the speck in your brothers. How could you possibly see anything when there's a beam in yours? Don't judge. Clean up your own act. Clean up those things that you're in charge of for yourself. No one calls for justice and no one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. Right? And they speak lies. He hates duplicity. He hates a backstabber. Because that's born of a weak character. And it lights a fire that you can't put out. It destroys families. It destroys relationships. And it destroys the bearer. It destroys the one who's doing it. But they don't, even though they don't know it. They rely on empty arguments and they speak lies. They conceive trouble and then give birth to evil. What is that? They conceive trouble. They plan it. They think it out. And they give birth to evil. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Verse uh, 13. It says, Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Even today, when people get instructed by others, even when that instruction has the best of intentions and love behind it, they know better. They don't want to listen to you. Why would they listen to you? This is saying, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. And when you look at other scriptures, it talks about, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. That instruction is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked, or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not even travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Walk the opposite way. Find the narrow path. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. 
they are robbed of slumber until they make someone fall. There's always some kind of rotten drama. They eat the bread of wickedness, and they drink the wine of violence. We see that in our society today, all over the place. And because we're products of our environment, some of it is underwritten in us. And this is what we're trying to expulse. This is what we're trying to get out of ourselves. Because we live around this rotten society. I know I find it quite a struggle to not succumb. Verse 18, the path of righteousness is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But in contrast, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And I'm going to turn here real quick while we have that in mind. Right? And I'm going to read something. While we just read this, I didn't have it written down, but I'm going to read it really quick. It's right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Right? So keep that in mind. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what even makes them stumble. They don't know that these ways lead to destruction. And they're, 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 they're incorporated and, and fully invested in that path. Let me read you this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with, he was with God in the beginning. Through Him, the Word, all things were made. Without him, the word, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life, not this temporal physical life, where we have begun a cycle all the way to death as soon as we're born. We have a time limit and the clock is, is ticking down. But real life, right? In him was life and that life that he could bestow, that he could give, and that he already has given by enabling us and giving us the Holy Spirit, was the, was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Imagine that. Imagine that. And we just read it. That this is the way of the wicked. They don't know what makes them stop, stumble. They dwell in darkness. They, they feel along the way where they're going. They don't understand. We understand. We understand. We know. Our minds are open. Job chapter 15. And Job we're going to get into at some point. Please. Please God we're going to get into Job at some point. Because it it's an amazing, an amazing witness. And there's so much in there. Well, this part here I'll read to you. Job 15, verse 31. Verse 31 says, Let him not deceive himself by trusting what is worthless. Right? For he will get nothing in return. Something wrong over there? Okay, play quietly. Good boys. I got my marker. Okay, that's fine. Okay, Grandpa's going to speak. Let him not deceive himself, verse 31, by trusting in what is worthless, right? For he will get nothing in return. Before this, before his time, he will be paid in full. What is that? He'll burn out not having realized the fullness that otherwise could be his. Here it is. Before his time he will be paid in full, and his branches will not flourish to capacity. He will be like a vine stripped of its unripe grapes, like an olive tree, shedding its blossoms, before anyone has any chance to realize on any fruit. And now that ties into everything that we understand about a good tree and a bad tree. And the fact that the Father wants to see fruit, and when he does, he prunes us, he trims us, so that we grow even more fruit. 
He will be like a vine stripped of its unripe grapes and like an olive tree shedding its blossoms. For the company of the godless will be barren, and fire will consume the tents of those who love bribes. Again, wickedness, dark places. They conceive trouble, and they give birth to evil. Here's that saying again. They conceive trouble, and they give birth to evil. We just read that. Their womb fashions deceit. Right? This also ties in with what Christ was talking about. About the, the weeds and the wheat. That an enemy planted some weeds among his seed, among his wheat. Right? That these people are who they are. They are who they are. But more importantly, you are who you are when you're born with a particular heart. You are who you are when your ears start to open and you have understanding. He's taking from what is his and making it known to you. It begins a personal relationship that's not predicated upon an organization. It does not predicate it upon a name over the door or a man or a woman. It's a relationship that you have between you and your God. Wow, and that's how it should be. Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Yes, the temple of the Lord. Doesn't that sound familiar? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. But only he that does the will of my Father. Not lip service. This is the temple of the Lord, is what they're saying, and they're on their way to worshiping God. And yet, if you really change your ways, in verse 5, and your actions, and you deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien and the fatherless or the widow, and you do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own heart, then I will let you live in this place, in the land that I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words, words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name? And you say, we are safe, safe to do all of these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Who do you think you're doing these things in front of? What do you think you're harboring in your heart? Do you not realize that he can see and he knows everything? Everything. Everything. So when you come before him, you call on his name, and this goes for anyone, then you got to make sure that you realize to whom you are speaking and to, to whose company you are entering. That's what he's telling them. And he told a very powerful prophet, Jeremiah, to stand there and tell them that as they're coming in. He told them to confront them. And he 
He did. He did. That same thing is in place to this day. When we're entering into a time of Passover, when we renew, renew our covenant, covenant with his son who performed the sacrifice, he lived a sinless life. He was kicked from pillar to post. And he was ripped apart and murdered for our sake. Out of his love. He's not going to let you disrespect that. No, oh, man. He's not going to let that happen. We're heading down to a time of saturation. Where all of these things are coming together. We're coming to that time. There's going to be a problem. God is watching. We've been saying that for a while. God is watching. People have been ignoring it. Okay. Then you need to accept the consequences that come with it. But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Imagine that. That's quite incredible. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. And verse 13. Imagine that, God telling them, you want to come here and inquire of me and speak from your mouth, from the teeth out, religious and holy things to honor me and yet you're disgusting? You won't even address what you harbor in your heart? No, it's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. Isaiah chapter 29, in verse 13 it says, the Lord says, and this is widely known, these people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only rules taught by men. And Jesus Christ quoted this right in their faces to the Pharisees. I believe that was in Matthew 15. He quoted that right to their faces, right to the faces of the Pharisees. See if I'm right. Matthew 15. Yep, yeah, right there. In verse 7 of Matthew 15, he calls them, You hypocrites. You liars. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you so many years before. And those same hypocrites are still here to this day. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain for no reason at all. Their teachings are but rules that have only been taught by men. Wow. That's amazing. Jesus Christ said that to me. Wow. We got to make sure that we're not hypocrites. Because we have that in, inside of us. All of us. We can be hypocritical. And we need to, like my brother said in the opening prayer, we need to ask God to help us struggle with the carnal nature and to expulse it, to get rid of it, and to help us every day. Hosea, chapter 5. Hosea, chapter 5, at verse 1. Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you Israelites. Listen, O royal house. Royal house. This judgment is against you. You have been a snare at Mizpah, a net spread out on table. The rebels are deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. Know all of them. I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. What does that mean? Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. 
What is that? A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. Israel's own arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. Judah also stumbles with them. When they go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, they will not find him. They will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. They are unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. There's that word again. Giving birth to evil. In Job. In Isaiah. Now Hosea says. Giving birth to illegitimate children. And that's what God says. Because you have forgotten me. I too will forget your children. Wow. Wow. Now their new moon festivals will devour them and their fields. A curse is going to come. And that's what I've said. When people dwell in the land, and naturally they have some kind of sense of justice, they have rule of law, they have a, a distinguishing between right and wrong, that's fine. Individuals can sin and they will be judged according to their own individual acts. But when we nationally call right wrong and wrong right. When we nationally make these decisions now, God's wrath is coming as a result of it. Make no mistake. Make no mistake about it. Because of all these things that we see, and I keep telling you, all we have to do is look back at our parents or our grandparents, and we need to ask ourselves, would they accept that? Would they say that this is okay? Or would our forefathers say, no way, that's wrong. So you do the math for yourself. Don't believe me. Don't believe a word I say. Do that own judgment in your own math in your own head. And you know what I'm saying is true. Where are we going then, if that's so? Where is all this leading to? We're entering into a special season. A season where the Spirit comes and judges the worshipers at the altar to see if those people have been doing the right thing through the year, which most of us haven't. But if they have been struggling and persevering through the year, if we don't start examining ourselves now, if we find ourselves standing at the door, knocking, he's not going to let us in. He even says that in his own words. He also says, here I am at the door, knocking. To anyone who opens the door, I will come in and make my home with him, and dine with him. He's knocking right now. When we understand what's right, and we understand what's wrong, and we can look out at a society that's increasingly becoming corrupt, we can we look at governments, people that are supposed to be exercising leadership and authority, giving permissions and credence to those very things that their own forefathers wouldn't, then we got a problem. There's an issue. There's an issue, and you know it. You feel it just as much as I do. Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Verse 21. These are not my words. These are words that I'm reading right from the Bible. These are words that the Holy Spirit authored. They're words of warning. There's also words of encouragement. So verse 21 of Jeremiah 5, it says, Hear this, you foolish and senseless people, who have eyes to see, but do not see. You have ears, but you do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not realize in whose presence you're standing in? Should you not tremble in my presence, verse 22, 
I made the sand a boundary for the sea. You can see that with your own eyes. An everlasting barrier that it cannot cross. The waves may roll, and in hurricanes they do, but they cannot prevail. They are held back. There's physical and invisible physical laws that are put in place. Even a cursory knowledge of science would help you understand that God exists because these laws just didn't come into being. Inertia, entropy, thermodynamics, gravity, all of these laws just didn't come into being. They were placed there. And even if you have eyes to see, you can see it yourself. That's what he's saying here. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But those people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They've turned aside and they've gone away. They do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives us autumn and spring rains and seasons, who assures, assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. Again, he's trying to teach you something. Verse 25, your wrongdoings have kept these away. Your sins have deprived you of good. Among my people are wicked men who lie in wait like men who snare birds and like those who set traps to catch men. Like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. They have become rich and powerful and they have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fatherless to win it. They do, not do, they do not defend the rights of the poor. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Such a nation as this. When we start making decisions nationally, like I keep saying, now God's hand comes upon that nation. And that's exactly what we've done over the last few years. We've made national decisions. That line has been broken. People don't want to know about God anymore. People do not want the Ten Commandments in their courthouses. People don't want to know about the Constitution. Because if you read the Constitution and you read a lot of what the Founding Fathers believed in, they believed and had a firm faith in God Almighty and in His authority. And a lot of them were very good men. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. We've seen a lot of that, this hierarchical system. We've seen people lord it over each other and tell them when they can speak and when they can't speak and box them in when they question their motives and not allow witnesses to speak, block them out. They don't follow the words of Jesus Christ. They follow their own path. That's what we see today. We see that right in, even in the churches of God, some of them. The priests rule by their own authority. This is God talking negatively about this practice. And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? What will you do when the recompense that's been waiting for you and for those actions comes to visit upon you? What will you do then? You Will you cry out? Probably. But no one will listen. Because now is the time to seek the eternal. While he can be found. While he's near. We know those scriptures. Those words live in us. So we have to act upon them now while our bellies are full, while he has given us full opportunity to do so. But so many of us, like he said, they are stubborn people, a stiff-necked people. They have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, and they hear, but they don't hear. The words don't go into their ear and down into their heart. They don't care until trouble comes. Then their attention is gone because they want to preserve themselves and their wicked ways. Good luck, they won't be preserving nothing. When trouble comes, it's come to punish them for their actions. 
It's come to deliver right back into their lap as their deeds deserve. They were warned. They did know better. They didn't do anything about it. Stubborn and stupid. It's not a good mixture. It's not a good mixture. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Done. We're not going to have time to finish everything for sure. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea. And he was saying to the people, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And if it was near then, by the presence and the appearance of the revealing of our King in Israel, who died for our sins and sacrificed himself and enabled us and endowed us with his Holy Spirit, took from what was his and made it known to us, then how much more nearer is it now? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John was he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who was prophesied to come. A voice of one calling in the desert. Imagine that. The barren wasteland. The voice of one calling in the desert. And he was in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. In other words, reconcile your hearts. Understand what you were raised to believe. Put aside your wickedness. And the wickedness that you harbor inside. And open your hearts to God Almighty and to one another. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food that he ate was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, thousands, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River for free. They didn't have to go and buy turtle doves and lambs and, and offer at the temple. They came to him out of the wilderness for free. The son of a priest. And it was his right. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing the people who were coming to him, like it said, confessing their sins. That's how these people were coming, with hearts that were right. He said to these guys, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And this is something that he said that was very key. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. My brothers used those words. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. When we have contention in the church, but brother hurts brother. Only God knows if that person, if they have come to apologize or to repent, only God knows if there's fruits of repentance, if they really mean it. And that's what John was telling them. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. They want to instantly insert an excuse and a justification for who they are. And like I say, when ministers in the churches got to remind you of their authority over you, then they have nothing to do with the serving Christ. Christ said to them, you call me Lord and Master. That's who I am. Make no mistake, I am your God. But I washed your feet. And if I, your Lord and Master, has washed your feet, that you should be washing each other's feet. I haven't come here to be served, but I've come here as one who serves. So if our serving God brought this revolutionary principle of servitude, it took the lowliest position, who are we to lord it over someone else? Especially if his own mouth told us not to. Do you see those Gentiles over there who lord it over one another? They jockey for position. They stab each other in the back. They fight for 
for, for a position one with another, it's not going to be that way with you. The greatest among you will be as one who is a slave to the rest. Yeah. We have Abraham as our father. Lord, Lord, did we not do many miracles in your name? And cast out demons in your name? And he turns to them and says, I don't even know you. I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. But the mouth of your God says that. You're done. But they had no heart to receive it anyway. They were going to justify themselves to their God and remind him of what they did. Same attitude. And John saw it coming and he arrested it immediately. And he didn't care about people's opinions if he might have been talking too loud or too forcefully. He had a job to do. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. What does that mean? And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, to prepare you, to wash you, to cause you to expose your hearts before your God, to prepare you for a time when you will enter into a new covenant. The same covenant we are about to renew. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I. So much more powerful, I'm not even fit to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into his barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's what he's going to be doing. And that's what he started to do right from that point, and that's what he's doing right now to this day. We're going to go to Luke 8 and close. Luke chapter 8. Because this ties in with what John was explaining to them. Any tree that doesn't produce good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to be separating with his words and with the very fact of his presence and of his sacrifice. God, is not going to, God the Father is not going to allow his son to be mocked or his sacrifice to be trampled on underfoot. Luke chapter 8 verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, thousands were mobbing him. He told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some of the seed fell on the rock, but when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Or root. Other seeds fell among thorns which grew up with it, and these thorns choked the plants, the good plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up yielding a crop that produced a hundred times more than what was originally sown. When he said this, he called out, right after he said it, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. And he said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, and though hearing, they may not understand what they're hearing. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Right? Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. Because they belong to him. They're his. 
If they were gods, you wouldn't be able to snatch anything away from them. Just like Christ said, they won't snatch them out of my Father's hand. They won't snatch them out of my hands. I won't lose one of them which the Father has given me. So that word can't take root in those people's hearts because they don't belong to God. They belong to the devil. That's why he has authority to take what was supposed to be sown in their hearts. So that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe only for a while, but in the time of testing, which we will all go through, they fall away. They fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. They're also choked by people around them that are in close proximity to them and that they are emotionally bound with. That's a fact. That's why Jesus said, if you choose mother and brother, son or daughter, wife or husband over me, you're not worthy of me. And yes, even your own life. And we read in Micah where it says, brother will betray brother even unto death. And Christ continued that when he warned them. He didn't come to bring peace. He came and he brought a sword, the sword of his mouth, the words that would separate them. But these words, the seed, they believe for a while, but when it comes to testing, they fall away. And those that fall among thorns are consumed with the cares of this world and their emotional connections to this world. <clears throat> but the seed, in verse 15, on good soil, stands for those who with a noble and good heart. What's that? This is what Christ said. But the seed on good soil stands for those who with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by, pers and by persevering, they produce a crop. This isn't going to be easy. By persevering, they produce a crop. And only by persevering. And only by persevering. Anyway, we'll continue next week. Thank you.